Hello guys, Alex Fedotov here and today we have an amazing guest. We have Ryan McKenzie, um, again, second time. Ryan is a co-founder of True Earth. This is the brand selling uh, very innovative products for laundry. These guys are crushing it. I'm here to catch up because we, we had conversation like last year. Just want to see what changed in the market. Uh, you guys are, uh, as long as I'm aware, you're in retail. Um, you are on Amazon, you're very big on Amazon, like your DTC. So kind of like what, what trends you're seeing and, uh, maybe some, some major like shifts since our last conversation. Yeah, there's, you know, I think <clears throat> the D2C or the direct to consumer worlds really, it, it, it has changed since I think it really, it all started with the, the whole Apple privacy, iOS 14.5, um, thing a couple of years ago but the you know the change in like the macroeconomic environment has has impacted a lot of brands it's a lot more difficult to get there's a lot more difficulty to get money there's a lot more difficulty to raise money people are um less obsessed with growth now and more focused on ebitda and profit because there's not you, you know two years ago, even a year and a half ago, there was so many aggregators that were just buying everybody based on, on revenue. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I think there was a lot of brands that were growing with the expectation that they'd be able to just get a multiple of their revenue, even if they were taking monster losses. And once the cash started drying up and it became more difficult to, more difficult to get money to continue uh, to burn, then mm -hmm. you know, I think we're at this like, moment in time where we're going to start seeing brands have the bottom fall out where they can't stick handle their cash flow anymore. And they're, since their acquisition costs have gone up so much, they're having difficulty. You know, it, it looks bad if you have a massive spike, massive spike, and then all of a sudden you're declining. Um, mm. So I think, I think that there's going to be two, I think a couple things are going to happen. You're going to see a bunch of brands go up for sale really cheap. And the brands that do survive are going to reduce their dependency on direct to consumer. And you're going to see more D to C only brands moving into places like Amazon and trying to get into retail and other marketplaces to extend their, their, their reach and their sales channels. Interesting. So, so you, you, you see the trend and you, you believe that, uh, you know, the, the brands that will, um, that kind of like D2C, like direct to consumer is not the most like innovative way of like of reaching customers. You, do you see more potential like in Amazon and like retail than like uh, expanding on, on D2C channels? Well, I, I mean, I mean, d d direct to consumer is generally going to be like either owning your own retail store, having like a catalog or mm -hmm. having like a website that like an e-commerce platform. But I think, <clears throat> you know, a lot of these brands are doing a lot of advertising and mm -hmm. the, there's, you know, I think there's 30%, just to give you one example, there's like 30% of the population in North America that will only purchase digitally from Amazon. So there's like, there's a certain oh, wow. segment of people, there's just, there's consumer trust that doesn't necessarily exist. And I think a lot of that comes from five years ago when drop shipping was taking 12 weeks to deliver like the biggest yeah. piece of garbage you've ever seen. But um, my point is, what I was going to say is that like the D2C brands are really great at advertising. And so they're mm -hmm. creating all this demand gen. There's other places, places that they could also be capturing that demand. And I think the first thing that a direct to consumer brand needs to look at when they're evaluating where should they go next in terms of where they can um, acquire additional customers that's not necessarily direct to consumer is in your category of products, where is the majority of that category purchased? And like using ourselves as a reference or a, a, a frame for this conversation, 80% of people purchase their laundry detergent while grocery shopping. So if I'm spending... Is that, is that like public information or you, you made your own, some, some, some of your own like research and, and like service? There's a lot of data out there. You can go to like Nielsen data. There's Statistica mm -hmm. that, you know, these reports usually cost like a thousand dollars or something like that. But this data is available to people if they're mm -hmm. willing to pay for it. But if you're creating all of this demand and you're not existing where 80% of the demand capture happens, mm -hmm. you're, you're basically, you're, you're missing out on a monster opportunity because, um, well, you're, you're, you, you've spent all this money advertising and building a brand yet you're not available where people buy that category. 
I think that there was an attitude in direct to consumer previously that you need to own the data. You need to own the data. Yeah. And there's ways that you can still get the data, right? Like you can put like a giveaway flyer or like a giveaway um, thing inside of your product that mm-hmm. they could sign up and you can capture their email. There's other ways that you can capture their email. Q- are, QR code maybe, right? On the, on exactly. the product itself. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But even, even, if, even, if you, even if you don't capture it, like, you know, it's still a revenue stream and you're all, it's also an advertising stream because people see your product now on the shelves who may not, may not use the channels that you're advertising on. Mm. Wow. So has that like, so now it's 2023, it's, uh, you know, we're in March 2023. I mean, you've been in business like a few years now. Have you seen like, for your business specifically, have you seen the distribution of like D2C, Amazon, uh, like retail, how it's kind of like evolving over time? How the distribution of, of revenue, like for instance, for your brand is changing? Yeah, I mean, originally it was, you know, almost entirely direct to consumer and like our e-commerce and like subscription and, uh, and one-time purchase e-commerce. And over time, you know, like... It, it, it's evolved. So it's still like, I would say a good portion. It's more than 50% is still direct to consumer, mm-hmm. but the other channels are growing faster than, 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 than the e-commerce or D2C mm-hmm. channels are just, I mean, if you look at like, I mean, I don't know how many grocery stores there are in North America, but I think we're, we're in like 7,000 plus. And I, don't, I think we're not even in half of them. So like, you know, just, just, to, just having one or two SKUs in 15,000 stores and selling one or two units a week is an enormous amount of money. Mm, cash, like, I mean, cash that you like literally is waiting there on the shelves, right? That you have to like, sink. yeah. For, wow. It, and it, it, I mean, you know, one thing it does, it, it will cannibalize your direct to consumer business. Like I know that for a fact because it's done it a little bit to ours, but it's the upside is greater than the downside. Mm hmm. Interesting. So what do you like? Do you use any particular solutions or platforms to like battle that like cash flow like issues or like negotiating terms with like retailers? <laughs> like what, what, what helps you to overcome those? Um, well, I mean, if I was giving somebody advice that was just getting started into retail, it would be to not jump to big box because there's the opportunity. The big box could potentially kill you, right? Like if you oh, wow. ship into a big store, and they decide last minute, like since you generally don't get payment until whatever, 30, 60, 90 days after delivery, if they decide, like, let's just say that they order a million units, you mm-hmm. produce those million units. And then most of the time, these big guys have so much control that they can cancel the order right up to the day that you ship it. So, and I know this is like pretty much killed some people before is you'll go and you'll make a million units. You borrowed money to do so, or you use all your existing cash flow to get there. And then your order gets canceled. Or if your order is late, it, it can, it can, it can kill you too. And then you're, you're screwed. So my recommendation would be to start with like specialty retail initially mm-hmm. where they pay up front. You do, you do small, small chunks and you evaluate how well that does before you go into big box because there's there's agencies and stuff that will give, take a percentage and get you in big box, do the negotiating. But two things, the cycles are really slow. So if you want to get into like a really big grocery store, they might only do your category once a year. So you mm. need to have somebody that knows how to pitch them, knows how to do all these things properly. Um, but then the other thing is, even if you get in, if you get in and you are not doing enough advertising or it, the awareness in that region isn't great enough to sell through the product, you could have your SKUs uh, you know, canceled eventually, and then you won't be able to get back into that store again, but like for a considerable amount of time, like that's the worst thing that could have happened. So it's, you kind of want to go on this journey, um, with baby steps because the consequences of going in too early or both cash flow wise, as well as, um, uh, inability to sell through are, are dangerous. So the sequence in which you would go, right? Like, would you still like, let's say you're starting like a brand, like let's say you guys exited like 100 million, 200, 500, you know, you guys exited, like you're happy, like now you want a new challenge, you're starting something new. In what sequence would you, would you go, this, like, would you still go first like direct to consumer, then would you go like Amazon, like 
and only then retail or kind of in what sequence would you would you proceed if you were to start today yeah i mean i think there's people have different opinions on how to validate products like some people like to validate on amazon i personally like to validate direct to consumer um but i would probably go direct to consumer right out the gate um validate my offer validate that the, the, there's the demand and that there's some level of scalability and then my second step would be go on amazon and make sure that that halo from my Facebook ads or my Google ads or my TikTok ads, that that spills over into that platform. And then from there, I mean, you know, I'm, we went really hard with this brand and we went like so many channels really quickly all at the same time. And it was pretty, for me, it was pretty high stress. And I think it was probably high stress for other people as well. Mm -hmm. If I was starting again, I would probably unless I had another product that was a category killer product like this, but if, mm -hmm. it, if it wasn't, I would probably start slower and I would, you know, maximize those channels a little bit before I went and added a third, but the third would probably be like after the marketplaces would probably be like specialty retail and mm. testing, testing the waters there. But again, that depends. Like it has to be a product that's sold in specialty retail and sold in big box before I'd, want to devote the resources to, to going after that. But I think with that said, it depends on what your, what your goal is, right? Like if your goal is to exit the business, when you get to 10 million in revenue or 20 million in revenue, mm -hmm. you might not even want to go in the big box because that leaves some meat on the bone for whoever wants to, you know, take over your company. Do you have like particular number in mind where you think like you becomes, you become like a, kind of like valuable acquisition target or just like it's more about the category that you're in like kind of like have, have you have you gave like a lot of thought into like like at what point you guys like planning to exit or yeah i i, I don't you know right now we did we did we ra ra bleh, we raised we did a venture capital raise last year in mm -hmm. april <clears> or <throat> we closed it sorry um and you know our, some of our metrics are tied to like how much plastic we can we can reduce um, and you know, when, when you have investors, the goal is to, is to try to bring the, the enterprise value to a certain point. And mm -hmm. luckily for us, the investors that, that we, we chose to go with are, um, <clears throat> they're, they're, it's actually called renewal funds is our main partner. And we have a couple other small guys, but they're all very, they're very like, um, environmental and sustainability focused. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our goals are, a lot of companies are just like, how, how do we get more revenue? How do we get more EBITDA? Mm -hmm. Where for us, it's like our contribution isn't just in dollars. It's also in impact. So, uh -huh. you know, the, the, the goal is to, to grow the company for at least a few more years. But ideally, when we get to a certain size uh, and somebody like who knows how to run billion dollar industries potentially takes over, we're hoping that we find proper suitors that you know believe in in the same mission that that we that we started because i mean at the end of the day man like money like yeah and you you're, you're we're, we're the same like i can go and i can start another business and make money like yeah it's not a big deal like i know that sounds super cocky or whatever but we understand the systems to, to yeah to, to so for me it's like would it be, would it be nice to to have enough money to to not have to worry about money again sure but this is kind of like a once in a lifetime um, opportunity for me to, to have <clears throat> like massive impact. And I don't want to, I don't want to like sit on the sidelines and watch somebody burn that to the ground. Mm. Makes, makes a lot of sense in terms of the expansion. So, I mean, you're pretty big in Canada, right? Like, so you, you're originally from, I mean, brand is established in Canada. Like, are you like number one, like market leader in Canada in your category? Yeah, for sure. Both digitally and retail. And is there like, um, what's your thought process? Like, do you still want to like maximize that market share? Do you, do you want to educate maybe some customers that are not in that category or like get them to, you know, to, to buy your products or like once market saturated, you're looking, okay, so what's the next market you can like tap into and, and maximize? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're also fairly aggressive in the U S but the, the the goal is to obviously um, like just what is people places, um, what are the four P's placements pricing? Um, mm -hmm. It's 
when, when you've kind of established yourself and you've, and you've got all the systems in play and everything's running smoothly, expansion to other markets is, is an obvious, um, obvious easy way in, well, easy ish. Like every European market has so many complexities and it's easy to fly under the radar at the beginning. Like I'm sure we've all run like broad traffic global and just sent people stuff from wherever, <laughs> but like, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you've done it. I know that's why you're laughing because, but like, but there's regulations cheaper, and stuff, cheaper man. Like, yeah. Cheaper yeah. Cheap. Well, my God, I just sold 42 packages to Turkey. Like, um, <laughs> But like it's uh it's funny because you can play that game until you get to a certain size and uh, people start noticing and there's regulations there's packaging regulations there's oh, really? all sorts there's language there's like you know every country and, and Europe's really crazy because each country really has their own sets of regulations oh wow and yeah so you have to go about it like we're, when we're we've already expanded we're in the UK we're in Australia we're in like. 75 countries but not at the same scale as we are in north america but that's the, that, that i would say that that's like one of the biggest things that people don't realize when like you know like the 22 year old kids that make like tiktok videos and and uh sell a couple million bucks for the product and, and think they figured it all out is that like <laughs> <laughs> is that like man it's like it, it, you do not know until you know like when if you when if you try to properly go in, in Europe like if you put your stuff on i don't know i had a buddy that was all over Europe on on Amazon mm -hmm. and Amazon eventually came and said like, you don't have tax numbers in all of these countries you spent you've made over this much money shut down all their listings wow. and then they were doing well there and then they had to go and get all these tax numbers set up for all of these different countries and then you know you dig a little bit deeper and you realize that, Oh, there's also all these other regulations that I have to hit and I'm just going to get shut down again. So you're better off like figuring out country by country or region by region, how mm. you're going to do like, what, what are the rules and what do you got to play by? Cause you don't want to get sued. You don't, there's so many things that could happen. Um, but I just totally tangented on, on expansion, but it is a lot more complex than the average person thinks if you do it properly. Mm -hmm. What is like the uh, the distribution of the revenue right now for you guys? Like, is a big big portion of your revenue is like international, or is like still like United States, like eighty percent, or like Canada, United States, Canada is like ninety yes. percent of the revenue. No, North America is like like I, I don't know the exact breakdown, but it's we're, those are our our biggest markets. Then you know, a couple UK and Australia, and there's there's a handful of them. We had distributors actually, <clears throat> um, we have distributors all over Europe, but. Being, having a distributor and having somebody that owns the brand operate in the company are two very different things because their margins are not the same as your margins. They don't have the same, they can't calculate their LTV the same way that you can calculate their LTV. So they're not going to go and spend a bunch, bunch of money aggressively building your brand in another region. Mm -hmm. So like, if you're going to use a distributor in another country, you need to be cognizant of that they don't have the same horse in the same race that you do. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're mostly demand capture, maybe a little bit of demand gen, but it's mostly going to be um, capturing whatever demand that you can create for that region. Mm -hmm. You mentioned one of the things very interesting that <clears throat> if you want to get into like retail, you have to first generate like a lot of awareness about your products. So then when people come to the stores, they actually recognize the product um, and in different areas of let's say United States, right? I mean, it's a big country. In different areas of the country, the awareness about your product would be different just because of how the ads are being distributed to, you know, certain, like, geos. So do you have, like, any way of, like, tracking, okay, we have to spend more on ads in taxes, or do you even maybe, like, strategically, like, target, like, hey, let's, let's target like taxes or like Austin taxes to get more awareness, to, to push more, more products there. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different tactics you could do. I mean, whether it's like <clears throat> geofencing stores or geofencing regions, um, you know, traditionally what, like if you were to not have the kind of exposure that we have access to, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of, a lot, like what would happen is you would go and you would like, <clears throat> let's just say, sorry, <clears throat> my throat's, 
throw try um you you would let, let's just use like i don't know um random grocery store number one mm-hmm. it's big chain random grocery stores big chains all over the u.s so traditionally what would happen pre-internet would be you would get placement in the store you would you know you'd get your your regular shelf placement and then each store or sorry each chain has like marketing programs Mm -hmm. so you could pay for like an end cap um you could pay to have like a sampling person come to the store and let people Mm. try the product you could pay to have like placement at the till um and there's a friend of mine he started a a pretty big alcohol beverage business here in in canada and he told me his strategy like because their alcohol they can pretty much do out of home and whatever is at the actual retail spot itself they would try to be located in seven places in every liquor store or <clears throat> cold beer and wine store that they were selling at seven places so wow. you know it's what it, i think the rule is like you take seven touch points before somebody makes a yeah. purchase if you suck at advertising oh um <laughs> 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 um so they they had to accomplish that at the liquor store because they're unable to do it the way that we do it. So that's the alternative too, is you can participate in like Costco has their own programs. Publix has their own programs. Mm-hmm. Like you can do an email blast to pop to, to Costco's list. Um, they have like flyers, they have in-store price reductions. They have all these different tactics that you can do at the store, at the store and chain level. Um, and some of them probably work fantastic. Um, you know, in-store price reductions definitely get more people buying, but if you're always on sale, then people don't buy it when you're regular price, right? So in your company right now, do you have like some head of retail or someone responsible specifically for retail or it's, it's, it's on your plate as one of the like channels that like... Not me, not, not me, man, not me, no. Um, so we have, we have uh, um, I think our director of sales positions is in, in like in flux maybe. I, I'm not sure. I think that's sitting empty right now, but we have like a... a um, we have like two teams. We have like a, a team for large retail and we have a team for um, like the small stuff. Mm-hmm. And we have a couple like business development guys. And then we have like a manager for um, for big retail. And then we have a manager for like the small stuff. And mm-hmm. um, it's a big team. I think there's like at least, there's at least six, seven or eight people um, mm-hmm. doing it. And like, they're, like the, there's some sophisticated sales systems. And then we also have, um, companies that are working for us to to do prospecting. So there's there's a, it is a, a, it's it's not like having one guy sitting in the back room picking up the phone. It's <laughs> it's complex, you know. So you observe like sales, like probably daily wouldn't make sense, or maybe daily like the reports. Okay, from each region, how much was sold, or is that how it works, or or it's more like on the macro level. It's like once a month you get a report, and then maybe you do something about it, or or not like. How how does that yeah like so the 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 answer is really it depends because every retailer provides different data at different frequencies and some some provide almost none and you have to pay for it so that's like one of their marketing (laughs) things Um, pay for the data well I I mean they're 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 all they're all different so some of them you do yeah some of them like like, wow so like they call it like spins and that's like basically how often you're you're cycling your your inventory I, i don't know the exact terminology i'm not total retail guy but um yeah so you you monitor and we're looking for you know we we track growth over time by by store and um where where we can and it's uh that's that's just it's kind of like you know generally we see upward upward trends over time but it's it's really on a like we have our, our our process obviously but it's contingent on the information that's shared with us from the um the the uh store itself and like the team manages kind of like their own their little promotions with each uh store independently so mm-hmm. um as a as a marketing team we're less involved like we help them with collateral and stuff like that but as a whole they're they're managing their individual promos to to uh, continue the growth chain by chain. On the AOV like side, like w- what have been like maybe like the, some of the biggest like learnings or some of the biggest like things that have have worked for you recently. Uh, so one thing that you see like a lot in uh, in our in our circles is is people arguing over like you know AOV is the most important thing or conversion rate optimization is the most important thing. And if you take subscription model out of the equation. 
really the, the most important metric is revenue per session because that's mm. kind of like the intersection of uh, conversion rate and AOV. Because mm-hmm. you know you could have like a million dollar AOV and then a point zero 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 one percent conversion rate, and that isn't you know that mm. I, I don't even know I just made that up. Or you could have you know you could have a ten percent conversion rate with uh, a, a twenty dollar AOV, and like so it's the intersection is really that revenue per session. So mm-hmm. how do you maximize like if the conversion rate drops? when we make an adjustment, but the AOV doubles, are we getting more revenue? Like, and that really, where that really matters too is if you're trying to be, trying to arbitrage that first sale and be profitable on the first sale, mm-hmm. um, that's incredibly important. Uh, that it, it may be less important if you need more customers because you know that your lifetime value is so high yeah. That you, then then you can kind of like you know, obviously there's a spectrum, but mm-hmm. I think like the gold standard. Anyways, I'm kind of like rambling about this. The preface that the 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 metric that I like to look at is that revenue per session, and so I think where a lot of brands struggle is they're like, okay, well I can't make enough money on this first sale, and it takes me a year in um, retention and lifetime value activities to break even or six months or three months or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So Facebook ads don't work for me or TikTok ads or Google. And they don't look at like their offer economics. So how can you adjust the offer to incentivize somebody to maybe take more products on the first purchase? Or how can you offer them like one click upsells or order bumps for uh, adjacent high affinity products um, that give them a better experience and like everybody, I know everybody knows about like one click upsells and, and everybody knows about order bumps, but like creating an experience that gamifies, uh, or, or rewards the consumer for, for taking additional items or taking more volume and like things like, um, like custom bundles with like discount ladders or things like, <clears throat> um, uh, gamified carts with like free shipping thresholds and free gift thresholds. Mm. Like these are these are mechanisms that can be applied. That like the goal isn't to be manipulative to the customer. Like those are those are there for them if they want them. We're not offering them crappy products. The goal is to incentivize them to uh, by if, if we incentivize them to take a bit more, we're able to spread our mission more aggressively and be able to reach more people. Um, and reach our goals from an impact perspective and not so much manipulate people and taking a bunch of junk they don't need. Mm. Is, is new SKU development one of the things that you do like constantly or like you're just focusing on like maximizing the SKUs and products you already have? Uh, I, you know, I think SKU, SKU proliferation can be a problem too. It's like if you, you don't want to put out too many SKUs if they're not producing like you, you need to have like guardrails on what's acceptable outputs from each SKU. Um, maintaining a ton of SKUs is a lot of work, especially mm-hmm. when you have when you're omni-channel and you're in a bunch of different places. Like, mm. it because you're maintaining packaging and there's um, there's like uh, what's it called um, regulatory stuff that you need to make sure that like when you're in retail. I mean, really everywhere, people just get away with it because. You know, they're doing it from the computer, but there's like regulatory stuff. And if one regulation changes, that means that you have like, you know, three products that only new packaging need to be recalled. So the skew, like adding additional SKUs that are high impact and um, uh, are valuable for the consumer and generate more revenue and, and push up your LTV are fantastic. Mm-hmm. But I, th- I think in the vein of simplicity uh, from a uh, uh, a business perspective, you're, you're, you're better off like killing SKUs that like obviously launch new things, test new things. Mm -hmm. uh, But if something doesn't hit your threshold for what's considered keeping the Mm -hmm. resource allocation in terms of human resources to maintain that product will probably be more than the actual benefit for you as an organization to continue to offer it to the public. Mm. So, so like an example of what what I'm trying to say is like, when you 
when you launch a business, you should determine, you should say like, okay, what, how do I, what, what, what numbers do I need to hit in order for this to be a success? And what mm-hmm. numbers, like what, 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 what define, what define success and define failure. And you should do that with a new product launch as well. And not just like keep it because you put the work in, like there's a maintenance cost and it sucks. So like, like don't be, uh, don't be precious with the things that you create. If something's not hitting the, the, the threshold that, that you've set in order for it to be worthwhile and it's mm-hmm. not contributing a considerable percentage of your, your overall revenue, then it's probably more work to keep it in your stable than it is to, to offer it to your consumers. Did you have to kill some SKUs? Um, we've killed a couple. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of them were, we, we, we had this like, we, we killed a couple size options. I want to say like two or three, like how many units you get per, per package. And then we made this like, we actually designed this like really nice um, canvas bag for mm-hmm. that you can put your laundry in. And it, it, it didn't sell. <laughs> it didn't sell that much. Uh, <laughs> we, wound up, we wound up giving it away as a gift for it with some, with some, with some stuff, but we wound up discontinuing it. Um, it wasn't like, we weren't like, Oh my God, people are just going to love this bag. It's so fantastic. But you, you think sometimes you just assume that some things are going to do better than they do, but yeah, that's life. What do you use for like attribution and like, do you even aim for like profitability on, I'm obviously you, you may be like, you probably aim for like profitability on like direct to consumer side, but like, do you actually get to profitability in the front end? And then besides that, all of the upsides of brand awareness, like on all other channels. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to, like, we have, like, we have our goals for, like, what we spend versus top line revenue and stuff like that. But um, for attribution, you know, we're, it's funny, we're, we're primarily still using, um, for, like, actual attribution, like, last click, like, customer journey tracking, we're mm-hmm. still just using GA. It's, like, it, it, it aggregates the UTMs. It does the same thing. It's just, you know, more complicated. Um but we also use measured, which is an incrementality tool. Mm-hmm. So Measure, I actually me- measured.com. Yeah. Measured.com. So, and then we're, we're also using bestie, which is like a post-purchase survey. And so somebody asked me a similar question the other day. And I actually think that none of the, like th- there's like a lot of tools out there. There's like triple whale, which yeah. is fantastic. Hyros. Uh, Rocker Box, North Beam. I don't like any of the stuff that models. St- I don't. I don't want to see modeled data. Like, like I, I already have modeled data from Facebook. That's that's good for me. You know, like I don't need modeled data. I want to see the from an attribution tracking perspective. I love how they can give me the customer journey. Mm-hmm. But I think like I think the, per- the here, here's what I think the perfect mix is. And as soon as somebody releases this, it's going to crush. What you need is your media buyer needs the customer journey data to basically for like micro decisions for like determining which creative is actually doing driving the sales. Like th- that's the, 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 the media buyer needs that it's specifically for like Facebook, Google, TikTok. Mm-hmm. Incrementality uh, is a fantastic tool for determining on a macro level, which platforms and campaigns are driving additional sales or eyeballs. And like, that's an amazing tool when you, when you're running like six, six, seven channels, whatever, five channels, because that mm-hmm. allows you to, uh, from, from like a CMO perspective or like somebody higher up determine how we're going to distribute our media spend across the different channels. Yeah. And then, but the problem with, uh, with those two is they only track your like last click or your first click or like click based metrics. Mm-hmm. So it misses like views. Well, view throughs are kind of there. Then I, I like a tool like bestie, which is like a post purchase survey tool. Mm-hmm. Um, and b- 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 there's a couple of them out there, but bestie basically you can ask people after they purchased where they heard about your brand, where they first heard, where they last heard, you can make them an offer in there too, or whatever. But what's cool about it is you have other platforms that don't necessarily track the click properly, like Snapchat, TikTok's wishy washy, and some people might have watched a video. Yeah. Um, if you get into like podcast advertising, you can use like coupon codes or whatever, or like TV or at a home, but you don't get really 
any great directional data off off of these metrics. Like you're going to get some off the coupon codes, but lots of people just forget about the coupon code by the time they heard about it on the podcast and get home and mm-hmm. search for it, right? So the the post purchase survey gives you like qualitative data that a lot gives you some insights, kind of like kind of like what like Triple Whale does for digital media buying on the non measurable tactics, mm-hmm. and you can look at you can look at like the macro breakdown inside of uh, the platform and analyze, okay, well, 6% of my sales are coming from podcasts. Oh, that's funny. Only like 1% are showing up in coupon codes or mm. TVs. Holy shit, TVs, TVs driven like huge percentage of the sales. And I didn't realize it. And so I think from an attribution perspective, it's not like one of these tools independently isn't, doesn't cover all of the different uh, pieces that you need in, or- in order to make quality decisions you need mm. you really need to be able to look at the qualitative data the the data from the media buying layer customer journey as well as like um the like doing the like the geo lift holdout experiments to get the incrementality and then all of these things combine into one big uh, uh model that allows you to run your machine optimally mm-hmm. how do you like do you have like all of your like media buying in house or usually hire agencies like how that structured for you yeah so um most of our media buying is in house but we usually when we're starting a new channel we'll test with uh an agency um to validate it because as you know like learning learning a new channel that generally has its idiosyncrasies and challenges and things that you you don't know about or best practices Mm -hmm. um so you know using an agency is a great way to kind of validate that something's working and um obviously when you get to a certain size the it it's probably price beneficial for a brand to, to bring it in house but the upside to using an agency too is that you get different perspective and you get somebody that works on other brands and knows what's working mm-hmm. and it's not just you know looking at it through your one-dimensional lens Cool. So how is your team? I remember last time we had a, it was like COVID, like, or I think it was like a slightly different. So how is your team structured? Like, is everyone in the office right now, like in house or you have a lot of, a lot of guys that are, um, uh, that are like kind of like remote? Yeah, it's like a mix. Um, we usually have like one day, one, one day, two days a week where everybody's in office. Um, uh-huh. And I, I was in the office probably five days a week, and I've, I've been probably in the office about three days a week lately. Um, just there, less people were showing up, so I was like, "Well, oh, my kids have so many activities. It's I can see why some people want to work from home a little bit." But mm-hmm. we're we're about one day a week for our team all in the office. Some teams are you know like accounting most of the time they're in the office, but um, it's nice because everybody gets to hang out and see each other and talk and uh, I don't know like. Working from home is nice, but it's also nice to collaborate and get answers quickly. So you have three kids, right? Yeah, I have three kids. <laughs> How is like the uh, so so you you're growing a business that's successful business, right? So what are the biggest kind of like you know lessons or uh, maybe like pieces of advice that you would give to someone who's kind of like trying to do both as as well, like? raise a family, a successful family, raise a successful business. Yeah. Uh, you know, I saw a tweet today. Somebody said, he's, he said he wouldn't, he wouldn't, back, he's a VC guy or want to be VC guy. And he said that he wouldn't back a founder that was in a relationship. And I was just thinking like, man, he, he like, wouldn't, he wouldn't back founder who, a wasn't founder that, really- who, who was in a relationship. Who was? Because he was, because I guess he felt that the, the pers- other person in the relationship would would meddle with their ability to work twenty four seven, and I think that like hustle Is that Elon Musk. <laughs> I don't I don't even know who I can't remember. I like kind of like I was gonna respond and I'm like not even worth it. But uh, <laughs> like man, like like you know, time blocking is probably the most essential tool uh, for for people. Anybody, I got ADHD, so like if I can do it, then somebody whose brain operates properly can do it. And like, really, what I do, like I have a I have a piece of paper here. I'm not gonna like, I'm not gonna show you what's on it, but like I break down when I come in the morning. I have a few things that are left over from the day before. Oops, mm-hmm. and um, and 
I come down and I write down the things that I have to accomplish for the day, the big things, like my two high payoff activities. And then I glance at Stripe and my messages and I write down anything that I might need to get done for somebody that responds to them. And I just break them down into like HPAs and quick things. And, um, you know, I work usually from like nine to five. I, the half time I don't take a break because I'm just in it and I, I'm, I, I don't mind. I'm just like, I don't know. I'm, I just go, I just go. And then I stop when I, when I have to, but I pound out the things. And as long as I, like, typically like, there's this thing called Parkinson's law, which like work will occupy whatever, uh, space you, you give it. That's not verbatim, but it's around the, like basically however much time you give yourself to accomplish the task is how long it's going to take. Mm-hmm. And, I know that if I'm not on a task, I'm like responding to a tweet or messaging somebody about something that's probably that I don't need to deal with right now. Mm-hmm. And at the end, of, like if you want to be successful, figure. And I suck at planning as a whole. I'll be the first to admit it. But like, figure out what you're going to accomplish for the day. Write it down and just do it. Write down two things that are that are high payoff activities. They might take an hour hour and a half mm-hmm. each. It might take 30 minutes, whatever they are. And then, you know, shut off your distractions and just when you get to that thing, do it. And when it's done, if you don't finish anything else for that day, those two things are moving your business forward. And then mm. when it's five o'clock and you, and you know, you want to go and hang out with your wife and your kids, you're not like looking at your phone every five minutes trying to respond to somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and you also don't, don't have like guilt, right? Because I think it's like, you know, most people that try to do like, many things at the same time and they don't do the things that they're important and internally they know what's important they know what needs to be done and now they have the guilt that they're carrying with them like the whole day and then after work and then reflects on their family and stuff yeah it's i i, I have that too and i think that i'm way better at being present than i was five years ago mm-hmm. i still i could still be better but it's also and I, and I like sometimes my kids are laying down and they're all asleep and I was yelling at them because they were all running around chasing each other just being kids and I'm like I'm like oh man I need to like calm down you know it's like it's uh y- you don't need to work 16 hour days to accomplish what you need to accomplish and there's lots of tools now like the, you know even like, is it is that, is that because like so I mean your, your perspective right now like because I mean your business has evolved right now you have a big team like do you think that's still applicable to everyone or it's like I mean at the beginning you, you probably have to do certain things by yourself right you have no team mm-hmm. members right yeah so like what it's your life is going to look like this when you're starting a business it's going to start with like no work and then it's going to go to this peak where you're so overloaded with work that you, you're like, you want to quit. And mm-hmm. then you're going to hire somebody and your workload's going to come down to like here. And you're like, oh, this is such a relief. <laughs> and then the business is going to grow and you will have delegated some of your tasks to that person and you're going to grow again and then you're going to go off the screen <laughs> and it's going, it's going, and, and it's going to suck again and you're going to be stressed and you're going to get burned out. And then you're going to hire somebody and you're going to come back down again and you're going to continue to do this as you grow because your job as an entrepreneur, especially if you're growing, you're doing things that you've never done before. And Uh every single time you do something that you've never done before, that's challenging. And, and, you know, usually these are going to get more progressively more challenging every, every time you take on something new because you're growing and those are stressful. Like I hate, like, Don't get me wrong. I'm happy that I've gone through a lot of these things, but every single one of them seems horrible until you get Mm -hmm. to the other side. And then it's, it's, it might not be as the next time you do it, it's not going to be as difficult because you've gone through, there's like a learning pit where like Mm -hmm. you fall down into this hole and you either like find somebody to help you climb out or you have to go through all the steps and, and trip over all the rocks and all the barriers and learn everything through experience to get out the other side or you, or you pay somebody who already knows to teach you how to avoid all those things. But once you've got over that, you know how to, how to jump over the pit the next time. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't even know where the hell I'm going with this man, but <laughs> it's gonna be like, yeah, I guess your question was like, for somebody new, you're gonna go through pl- periods. Like somebody actually asked me this yesterday on Twitter. He's like, I, uh, I started a writing, copywriting business and now I'm so overwhelmed, I have so much work, I don't know what to do. I'm like, dude, I want you to write down all the things that you do in a day, all the different tasks. And then I want you to break them down into 
like categories on, on what these are. And then whichever ones that you don't want to do anymore that are causing you a lot of, to use a lot of time and stress you out, I want you to make, write down the standard operating procedure for how to do this because you know how to do this task already. And as soon as you can go and bucket enough of these things into one group and write, write processes for them, you can hire somebody and then you don't have to do that anymore. And the mm. beauty of it is you know how to get more work. So if you can go, know how to continue to go and get more work, you can now go and get another chunk of work mm -hmm. and, and, and then delegate the other part of the work. And you know, you're, you slowly get to the point where you can move out of the business and have other people operating it. If you were to give like one piece of advice to yourself like five years ago, right? Like, what would that be? Let's see, five years ago, Ryan. Um, the, the advice that I would give myself five years ago would be to simplify everything and stop chasing the shiny stuff. Mm -hmm. Double down on what's currently working and don't over allocate resources because if you over allocate the, the amount of people there are to the amount of work, everything gets done half-assed and you can't do anything well when there's not enough people or not enough hours to do the work or give, to, to, to give the work the attention it deserves. Basically, like if, you, if you're doing well with like, I'll, I'll turn this into something more simple. If you're doing well with Facebook or you're doing mm -hmm. well with Google ads and you're continuing to see results, don't take your existing team members or, or even just yourself and go and start doing TikTok ads because you see everybody else doing it. If there's still room to grow on the channels that you're doing, continue to grow there because mm. you need a whole nother set of skills and you need to learn a whole bunch of stuff in order to do this other thing well and you can't do all of them well at the same time you just mm -hmm. there's only so many hours like like uh strategy is the ability to allocate limited resources to the tactics that are going to have the most benefit and mm -hmm. that is the skill to master is resource allocation resource allocation so most most entrepreneurs like where they like they're trying to do too many different things they're kind of going in too many di different directions yeah I, I think so I, I did at least that's that's that I, I can I did too I did too <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like uh, that resonates awesome so um <clears throat> what's next for like for for tourists like what's what are the major kind of like um I mean maybe it's like it's private but it's like Maybe something that you would like to share, like yeah, you know, it's, it's it's more it's more product launches. Like we just launched our uh, our dishwasher tablets. They're they're mm. different than they're different than your traditional dishwasher tablets. They kind of look like a Kit Kat bar, and you can just snap one off, uh -huh. um, which allows us to fit way more units inside of a package than um, than say like traditional tabs. Like the traditional pod, we can fit about three to four times the number of our tablets in the same space that um, like the, the big boys are packaging. So that's great for saving space, easier to ship, less carbon emissions. Um, but really it's, you know, we're, we're trying to continue to produce products that eliminate plastic waste. And mm -hmm. there, there's a couple more in the pipeline. Um, and the, the big thing is really going to be getting these into retail. And like, it's one thing to sell them direct to consumer, but um, you know, if you can get in 7,000 stores, sell one item a week, that's, that's a lot of product to move. I've heard this is the benchmark, like one product a week. That's kind of like what something to aim for, right? I think it depends on the size of your product, right? Like if, 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 if our product was the same size as a jug of traditional laundry detergent, uh -huh. one a week would probably be bad because it's taking up a ton of shelf space. Yeah. But we can fit like 12 or 15 units in the same space as one jug. Mm. So if we move, like, you, I don't know necessarily if they think in lineal feet, but you have to think about, uh, like if you're taking up a huge chunk of real estate in the store and you're only making them $3 a week, that, that sucks. But if you're taking up like one square foot, and you're making them however much, you know, that, that's a win. So retailers, I mean, they look, they look at every particular vendor as like a money maker. Like 
is that a money maker or it's kind of just wasting our space right that is that how they evaluate like all the data as well I, 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 I'm assuming so. Like I, I'm assuming that they're probably optimizing their uh, revenue, revenue per like per space as well as mm-hmm. like you know per per customer. And for us, it's like okay, well, we can fit in the space of uh, three rows of uh, uh, jugs, which probably holds you know nine nine containers. We can hold uh, like a hundred and I don't know, 150. So mm-hmm. it's, it, it's just, there's just a lot more. For, I don't know exactly how they how they do it, to be honest, Alex. But it, it, that's a, one way that we can pitch it to them uh, mm-hmm. is the efficiency of the the, the the space. Awesome. All right. Um, so yeah, thank you, Ryan. Uh, always pleasure connecting with you. How can people connect with you? Uh, a couple of different ways. They can find me on Twitter at r y e. M C K E N Z I E. That's Ryan McKenzie, or uh, they can find me on YouTube. I've got a channel. If they search for my name, Ryan McKenzie, they'll uh, usually post in at least uh, one video a week there. So, lots lots of cool stuff for tactics for, for yeah, the team. very cool like YouTube channel, guys. I highly recommend uh, you subscribe to Ryan's YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, Ryan, uh, thank you so much for 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 making the time. Um, and yeah, looking forward to to the next breakthroughs and uh, new products and. Uh, very nice exit in a few years. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate, appreciate it, Alex. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan.